Hey everybody here in the room and at home on Zoom. Um, my name is Carol Almond morton I'm the executive director here at Ollie at Berkshire Community College. If you're visiting us, I'm so glad that you're here and uh, welcome. I have just a few announcements and then we'll get rolling. We have a number of online and in-person programs coming up in the next month. I encourage you to take a look at our calendar, which is berkshireolly.org forward slash events. In particular, I wanted to let folks know that our winter semester is coming up. It starts mid-January on the 22nd, and uh, classes will be up and registration will open on December 12th. On December 13th at 11 a.m., we have an in-person open house here at the college in the Connector Lounge. Um, also, we'll be sending out a video to everybody on our mailing list, or you can find it on our YouTube page. That'll go up the Friday before that so people can learn about courses are uh, from the instructors that are that will be coming up for January. So um, come to things. We have a lot of stuff coming up and we'd be delighted to see you and uh, see you virtually on Zoom. Um, if, as you go, we, if you have questions, if you're at home, you can put them in the chat. Uh, Troy is going to do his presentation and then we'll do questions at the end. But if you don't want to forget what your question was, you can put it at any time and, and we'll, we'll get to them when we come to Q&A. And then for folks in the room, you can you can raise your hand. So, we ready to roll? Okay. <laughs> uh, Troy Amuso, welcome. Troy entered the world of art restoration in 1977, working as a studio apprentice in Southern Westchester County, New York, under highly respected Dutch art conservator. Oh shoot, I should have asked you about pronouncing this before we start. Jan van der River? River? Okay. Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> It was that unique opportunity that sparked Troy's passion in the craft of art conservation, setting him on a path toward an unyielding career as a fine art oil painting conservator. From 1977 to 1995, Troy held studio positions focused on the preservation of fine art in New York, Connecticut, and Los Angeles. It was during those formative years that Troy earned a respected reputation for his conservation work from art collectors, art galleries, and private museums throughout the Northeast and the West Coast. We're delighted you're here. Welcome. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you. Thank you for coming out tonight. And um, everyone on Zoom, thank you for tuning in. Um, so as you know, my name is Troy and I have been restoring paintings for most of my life. I was very fortunate um, as a young man to be given what I consider a gift. I was given a job sweeping the floors for an art conservator and he was a very prominent Dutch art conservator and his name was Jan van de Viver. And Jan worked on wonderful master paintings for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And so it was commonplace for me to be able to spend my afternoons after school sweeping the floors around master paintings like Rembrandt and Turner and Degas and all these wonderful pieces. So um, I became very comfortable uh, kind of being around that world. But I was captivated watching Jan work on paintings and creating almost magically bringing these paintings to, to life, some of which were in very dire condition. Um, of course, many of the museum paintings were there for conservation purposes, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, but many of the collectors and, and clients of his would bring paintings in that were in dire condition. So to watch paintings be brought back to an amazing condition from a very terrible condition was just captivating to me. So anyway, um, 25 years ago, we started about 25 years ago, Denise, my wife Denise and I started Troy Fine Art Services um, and we, have a studio down in Fairfield, Connecticut, as well as here in the Berkshires in Ashley Falls, um, just down south of Sheffield. Um, and so I want to jump into kind of what we're going to talk about tonight, because I have a lot to say. Um, I'm going to try to squeeze it into an hour. So um, I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey, and we're going to go through what 
are some of the environmental effects that kind of wreak havoc with paintings and fine art of all kinds for that matter, but I'm gonna really focus on paintings. Um, what those effects look like on your painting, because they're not always easy to recognize, as well as what some of the treatments are that we as art conservators do to what I call bring paintings back to good health. So let's start out with um, what, now, um, hold on one second. Hold on, everybody. I have a little technical difficulty here. I, I did, but thank you. Okay, anyway, sorry about that. So what does a painting look like that needs to be restored? They don't always, like I said, they don't always look obvious, but here you can see a painting that is in dire condition that really needed to be restored. Now, the interesting thing about this painting and the reason um, I put this in the front of the presentation for tonight is because it has kind of a cool connection. This gentleman's name is Thaddeus Clapp, as you can see, and this was painted in 1848. And Thaddeus was a very successful businessman here in Pittsfield back in that time. Thaddeus was one of the first businessmen in this area to begin a fabric milling business. And he became very successful um, and became a very prominent member of the Pittsfield community and the Pittsfield business community. So the story of Thaddeus um, is pretty interesting. Um, Thaddeus's painting was passed down left in estates to different members of his family through the generations. At one point, it landed with a great, great, great niece um, who lived down in the Atlanta area. And somewhere around 1920, 1921, um, it's told, I'm understood that the painting was in a very bad hurricane where it was almost destroyed and left in basically in this, in this condition. At the time, the family had taken the painting and they had boxed it up and they had put it into storage where it remained for a hundred, about a hundred years of time until it landed in my studio. Um, it was then, it had been left to somebody that um, wanted to restore it back to its original glory if possible so that they could bring it back up here to Pittsfield and display it here in the Pittsfield Museum. Um, so, hello, gentlemen. So, um, how do we go from Thaddeus needing to be restored to the finished product? Um, you can see he was fully restored. He was a wonderful restoration. And he needed the whole, the whole gamut of, of restoration processes. So, which I will talk to you about in other details as we go along. Okay, so let's talk about some of the environmental effects that wreak havoc on paintings. The first is sunlight. Sunlight is kind of the kind of the kiss of death for for artwork. It's a kiss of death for paintings. Um, it wreaks havoc and fades color. So just like we put sunscreen on to go to the beach or to go out in the sun to protect ourselves from burning, um, and newspapers. I like to tell the story of how um, we we're very digital now. But if you still read the New York Times on Sunday morning, um, and it's a summer day and you go out and you're sitting out in your backyard and you're flipping through the paper and you're drinking a coffee and you're ready to go on with your day and you take the paper, you put it down on the table and you take off for the day. You come back, maybe you went to the beach, you come back from the beach and you go out to collect all your stuff you left out 
in the yard for the day from the morning. And the top of the newspaper, that top sheet, is now turned yellow. Has anybody experienced that? Right? That is the work of ultraviolet light from the sun frying the newspaper. The newspaper's newsprint, it's very acidic. So the ultraviolet light creates a reaction with the acid in the paper and makes it yellow really, really quickly. So sunlight um, with paintings, the most important thing I always tell people is to keep your artwork out of direct beams of light coming through your windows. So if you've had your windows treated in your house with uh, the ultraviolet filtering film that protects from ultraviolet light, it will protect from the atmospheric light in your room, but it will not protect from a beam of light coming. You know, like the light moves through the seasons and all of a sudden, like there's a time of the year where all of a sudden there's this beam of light that comes through a particular window in a room that's not there the rest of the year. Watch for those things, because if that beam of light takes aim at one of your paintings, it's going to do damage to it, even if you have the ultraviolet filtering film on your windows. Um, it, it, heat, is, heat is an issue, and um, not so much the heat of the day, but as an example, if you're storing a painting, you don't want to store it up in your attic. Attic is like an oven once a year for the summer season. Of course, if you live in a hot climate, then it's uh, kind of like an oven all year round. But um, throughout the summertime, you know, nobody wants to clean the attic in the summer because it's just so blazing hot up there. So just imagine if you have a painting or multiple paintings for that matter, stored up in your attic, they're being baked every summer. That creates a lot of it, that creates oxidation issues and issues with the canvas that I'm going to talk about as I move forward. So heat is um, something that you want to be careful of. I'll give you a quick example of um, how heat can be a problem with lighting. Now we're very fortunate that today we have the invention of LED lights, and LED lights create no heat. It's been a great thing for the art world because now we have picture lights that don't get hot. But one day when I walked into a client's home and they had this beautiful 1920s painting on the wall in their entryway. And when I walked in, the lights were on and it was cracking right in the center. There was like this big splat of like an eggshell crack, like a spider web coming out from the center of the painting. And as I'm looking at it and I'm looking around at the lights, I noticed that there is a light up in the ceiling. It's a halogen picture light and it's not turned on. And I asked the client if they would turn the light on. They flipped the light on and bam, the bolt, the beam of light went right into where it was cracked. So for years, this halogen light had been shining on the painting and heating it up right in that same spot. And it oxidized the paint and caused it to crack. That would continue to go on and create more and more issues where the paint would start falling off had it not been treated. So heat is um, something you want to be very aware of. Um, dampness. So the flip side of heat is um, you don't want your paintings to get damp. Now, we have a lot of humidity changes around here in the Northeast. I mean, we have hot days that are humid. We have hot days that are dry. We have rainy days. We have snowy days. We have, all, we have water, if you live near a water, a lake, if you live near the ocean. Um, the humidity and moisture in the air creates a lot of um, expansion and contractions with paintings. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in depth in a minute. However, um, if you store your paintings not in the attic where they're baking and you put them in the basement where it's nice and cool, you have the reverse effect. Now your paintings are down, basements are underground. There's moisture down there. So unless you have a really, really good um, uh, anti-humidity um, dehumidification system in your basement, um, keeping the, the uh, humidity levels very level there, your paintings will develop things like mold and mildew. And that's a problem. So if you remember, there used to be a, a commercial, they called them the scrubbing bubbles. Do you remember those commercial for that cleaner and all these little guys with the brushes and they go around scrubbing stuff? 
So I attribute mold and mildew on the back of a canvas to like a scrubbing bubble. Only the scrubbers aren't brushes, they're teeth. And those little guys are just sitting there slowly biting into your canvas and deteriorating your paintings. So you wanna make sure that you don't have that issue happening. Um, smoke, we're very fortunate that the smoking culture has really changed. Um, so we don't, you know, we don't walk into, you know, those foggy smoke filled rooms, at least not as much as we used to, if maybe not at all, hopefully. Um, not that I encourage vaping, but you know, the fact that we don't smoke is a good thing. However, however, if you're looking at a painting, I don't know, just simple round terms, pre-1900, paintings spent years in 18, an 1800 painting. So 19th century, 18th century, 16th century paintings, they all hung out in rooms that were what? They were lit by candles. They were heated by fireplaces not just a fireplace on a Sunday night around the holidays. I mean, fireplaces in every room, every single night. And in those days, architecture wasn't as um, efficient and as it is today. So fireplaces weren't, you know, the drafts and things weren't exactly perfect. They were burning all the time and a lot of stuff was floating in the air. Candles, soot from candles floats in the air, whether you have one candle on the table or you have a room full of candles like they did in those days, there's a lot of soot coming off that wax and it floats in the air. Now you may not be aware of it, but it's there. So I always say, sometime if you haven't seen, you probably have seen this, but you get a beam of light from the sun coming into a room and you see all those little particles floating in the air. You ever seen that? It happens in every room. It's not a reflection of how clean your house is. It's just the fact that there is stuff floating in the air. There's stuff floating in the air right now. I attribute it to like snow flurries. Eventually that stuff starts to accumulate. And if it just keeps going, like, like the things floating in the air do, all that stuff accumulates, like paintings are like magnets for that stuff. It all sticks to the front of your painting. Um, and causes it to turn kind of gray and discolored. So getting back to smoke though, um, many old paintings that come across my, 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 my table in my studio is a lot of the old paintings have smoke on them and they, they're very yellow, right? Um, and once we take that smoke off, We're back, we're back, there we go, we're back. Okay, battery change there. Okay, so um, yeah, so it's smoke. Smoke oxidizes, oxidation is a big world, is a big word in my world. I say it all the time about so many things because lots of things, oil-based um, substances oxidize and I'll get more into that in a minute. Um, aging and time is kind of a culmination of all the things I just talked about. You know, things just happen, like things happen to us as we go through time. Um, paintings go through many years and they just age. Paintings don't survive on their own. They need to be, I always say paintings need to be looked after, they need to be cared for. Um, so at that point, I just wanna mention this. So I get asked the question, Troy, you're an art conservator, but you restore paintings. So what is the difference between art conservation and art restoration? And it's kind of a multifaceted answer and the two overlap um, much of the time. But basically the difference is this, you go to the doctor and you get a checkup. The doctor looks you over, checks your blood pressure, checks your weight, checks your breathing, your oxygen levels, all those 
all those things that we need to have right. And he says, gee, you know what, Troy, your cholesterol is a little high. I want you to maybe adjust your diet or you got to exercise or, you know, um, yeah. So I, or that would be, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought for a second. Um, that would be a time when you're being conserved. The doctor is looking over you. He's given you a couple of little pointers of things that will get your health to stay and remain in good shape and in good health. A painting, it would be a simple cleaning or it would be a cleaning and a revarnishing, um, keeping the painting healthy and in good order. A restoration is you go to the doctor and the doctor says, Troy, your arteries are packed. You're a walking heart attack. We got to get you in for surgery like right now. That's restoration. A painting would be the, the canvas is deteriorating. The paint is cracking and it's ready to flake off of the canvas and it needs to be restored. So those are the differences of conservation is to keep art in good order and restoration is to keep art in good order but it's the requirement of needing major work to keep it that way, and maybe to bring it back and keep it in good order. Um, and last but not least, Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall and he broke in a million pieces. Paintings fall off the walls. Paintings get moved. People paint the dining room or the living room, take the paintings off the wall. They lean it against the table and don't realize they're leaning against the sharp edge of the table. And all of a sudden they turn around and the painting has gone through, or the table rather, has gone through the painting, and now the painting has a tear in it. So I get a good amount of those things. I had a painting come in just over this past year. It's a beautiful antique painting, large painting, this beautiful little boy. Um, the woman brought it at an art show, at an antique show, and she brought it, and she went to put it in the back seat of her car. There was something on the back seat. She didn't think twice about it, really, put it in. She got home and there was a big hole in the painting. She didn't even put it on the wall yet. Brought it to me and I fixed it for her. Okay, so moving on. What do paintings look like? Like what are some of the effects that we may not be aware of um, that show that a painting may need some kind of treatments? So this painting um, is a really good example of what we call grime. So in, in the art con conservation world, we talk about two things. We talk about yellow varnish, and then we talk about grime. And grime is basically the buildup of everything from all the things I just talked about, smoke buildup, dust buildup, um, uh, soot coming off of candles, dirt, what, things that just build up on the surface of a painting that discolor it is what we consider grime. And there's a certain way that we clean that off the surface. Many times grime is sitting on top of yellowed varnish. Um, and then that's a, a kind of a two-tier cleaning process that we do to the painting. But what, a, what this will do, and you'll see in a minute, is this will really change the personality of the painting. Right, this just looks like a gloomy day. Like they're waving goodbye to the boat because they're going out into some gloomy storm that's rolling in. And that may not be the case. So oxidation is, as I mentioned, it's the process of the hardening of oil paint. And what that means is if you take a water-based paint, the water-based paint dries by evaporation. The water that's in the paint evaporates into the air and the paint dries. So like when you paint your house, you paint a room with latex paint, you go in a couple hours later, paint's dry. The water that was in it, the moisture that was in it evaporated and the paint's dry. Well, oil paint doesn't evaporate, it oxidizes because oil doesn't really dry. It's a different type of material. So um, as it dries, it begins to harden. Now, what's really important about that is oil paint takes years to oxidize fully. So 
Um, many people or many artists that use oil paints love to use oil paints for a lot of reasons. But one of the nice characters of oil paint is it dries really slow. So you can work on a painting for, for as long as you want to, for the most part. You can just keep painting it and the paint won't dry. And the more you manipulate the paint and add new mediums and things on top of it, it reactivates the oil and the paint just stays workable. So you can keep an oil painting going for a really long time, where if you're working with a water-based paint, it dries really quickly. So it's hard to keep it going. So over many years, um, as so if you're gonna varnish an oil painting, you have to wait six months for it to dry enough so that the varnish on the painting doesn't reactivate the paint, right? There's solvents in varnishes. So that, that solvent will reactivate the paint and the paint will bleed into the varnish and cause the varnish to get hazy and discolored. So you have to wait a minimum of six months. You're waiting for the oxidation process to begin basically. So over many years, going back to the differences in humidity changes in the air. So let's say that this is canvas, my hand, this is canvas. And my fingers are the fibers of the canvas. And this is oil paint. And this is non-oxidized or low oxidized oil paint sitting on the canvas. As the humidity rises, the canvas absorbs that humidity from the air. It's on a micro level. You won't know it's happening, but it's happening. You may see a painting get loose or look like it's loose on a canvas sometimes, maybe in the middle of the summer when it's real humid out. That's the canvas absorbing humidity and expanding. So um, just like you have, a, a dry, if you put a dry sponge under running water and the sponge is real small, and you put water under it, and the, as the sponge absorbs the water, it expands and opens. The same thing happens to canvas, right? And then when it gets dry, the canvas dries and contracts. So all the time that the, the oil paint is not fully, fully oxidized yet, it's elastic, it's, it's oil-based. So it's got, it's got elasticity. So as the canvas expands, the oil paint expands with it. And as it contracts and dries up, the canvas contracts and the oil paint contracts with it. But when the day comes that the oil paint reaches an oxidation point that's making it hard enough that it loses its elasticity and the canvas is gonna expand and contract forever for its whole lifetime. But once that oil paint decides it's so hard it doesn't wanna stretch with the canvas anymore, that's what happens. It cracks the canvas literally pulls the paint apart and cracks it. Now, the problem that will occur from that, if you see a painting that you have like that, we can't make the cracks go away, but we do treatments to them that either help to close them up, we seal them off because we don't want moisture and the humidity to get in the cracks because when the moisture and humidity gets into the cracks of a painting, That's what happens. Oops. That is the result of the painting has cracked. It wasn't treated. It wasn't sealed up. The humidity keeps going in the cracks and it gets between the paint and it does something called, we call cupping. So if you see, plug anything here, if you see up in here, you can kind of see a shadow line right there. You can kind of see, I don't know if you can see it from back there or zoom. I don't know if you guys can see that. You probably can, but you can see where the paint is lifting off the canvas. That is called cupping. And that is the paint has allowed the humidity has gotten underneath and the humidity has lifted the paint and broken the bond between paint and canvas. And that's where you get paintings that start to flake and lose paint. So when varnish oxidizes, it turns yellow. So many people, some may, sometimes people know this, some people, times people don't, but the general consensus is, well, varnish just turns yellow. Now, the reason varnish turns yellow is because varnish is a resin 
and it's a natural resin, at least traditionally it's a resin, it comes from trees. And as that resin oxidizes over time, it naturally ambers out. It starts to turn like a, a clear amber tone, and then it turns a darker yellow until it'll turn almost like a really, really badly old oxidized varnish will be almost grayish yellow. It really, really changes the color tone of a painting. Um, so we want to remove that so that we can show the original painting as it is. Now, the beauty of oil paint, as you'll see as we move forward, is oil paint has an amazing ability to retain its color value. It really, if it's been, if it's been taken relatively good care of, it hasn't sat in the light beam of, an, of the sunlight for its whole life, it holds its color tone pretty true. So when we remove that varnish, the true personality of the painting comes out. The painting isn't meant to look like that. I get a comment a lot where, where people, I do a bunch of social media stuff. So um, it's a good way for me to just kind of share out to the world. And I, I follow other art conservers literally from around the world. We talk a lot on, on social media and stuff, but um, people will comment and say, my God, yeah, the painting looks great. It's not yellow anymore, but you took all the kind of the age patina off of it. It doesn't look antique -y anymore. It looked beautiful like it was. And I say, no, that's, that's not how the artist intended it to look, right? So when they cleaned the Sistine Chapel ceiling, there was all that, there was like 50% of everybody loved it. And the other 50% were kicking and screaming saying you wrecked the ceiling. And I say, no, they didn't. Michelangelo didn't paint the ceiling to be dark and dingy. He painted it to be vibrant. It was colors of the day. People get too used to watching black and white movies and think there was no color back in those days. Well, you know, back in the, in the uh, 15th century, there was a lot of color around and that's the way it was meant to be. So really important to keep paintings vibrant. So here's a, an example of Thaddeus who was very grimy. Of course, he had been in this storm. He was found out in the ruins of a destroyed house. He was wet and he was dirty and then he was put in a box. And that is an example of grime. And you can see up in his forehead is just one little area that I went in and did a preliminary clean on just to see what's going on on the surface, what's sitting under the surface of grime. And you can see the true colors of his face, of his forehead starting to come through. Queen Elizabeth I, this was um, a painting that came in that was just, just covered in super, super thick yellow varnish. And so you can see the reveal of her face is just, it's amazing. It's staggering to see. And, and you know, one thing for me, I always say, um, one of my absolute favorite parts of what I do is cleaning paintings. I mean, it's, it, it's great to take paintings and put them back together from ruin, but there's nothing more satisfying than taking a, a swab with a certain type of solvent and putting it down on a painting and cleaning a section and saying, oh my God, look at the color that's coming through. The color this painting really is, is amazing. So um, very satisfying to, to clean paintings. Um, okay, like I said, a dirty painting changes the personality of the painting. This really wasn't, I mean, it looks like a dingy, rainy day in late fall in the Berkshires. It wasn't really meant to be a dingy day like that. It was actually kind of blue sky with a little bit of overcast and um, with beautiful colors in the trees. It was a completely different painting um, after it was cleaned. That was a grind. That's grime there. That's smoke and just buildup of years and years and years and years. So going back to this paint I showed you in the beginning. So check it out. It wasn't the grin. It wasn't see you. You're going off into the storm. We may never see you again. It was oh, it's a beautiful day. See you later. We'll see you when you get back. Right. It was a blue sky, but look at how dirty it was. I left that one little section purposely to show you guys in presentations of just check out the difference in how dirty paintings can be. So 
another kind of smoke that we deal with is house fires, unfortunately. And paintings can get really, well, of course, paintings can get destroyed in house fires. Um, but they can get really, really, really smoke damaged and heat damaged from being in a house fire. This particular painting came to me. It was in a burning living room. A conscientious firefighter saw it, grabbed it off the wall, and frisbeed it through the front window right out onto the front lawn, true story. And he saved the painting. I mean, I think the house literally like burned down. So the, the client lost like everything except for certain things, but this was one thing that was saved. And that was the result of cleaning it and bringing it back. So um, as you can see, what looked like a completely destroyed painting was still alive and well underneath the surface. So um, all these things can be corrected. Sometimes paintings get so heated up that they start to melt from fires, and that can be another issue. But smoke, if you've ever seen a painting that looks really dark and you just think there's no hope for it, there probably is. So this is pure cigarette nicotine. Look at that. There you go. This came out of a house. Um, it belonged to um, a relative of the person that took ownership of it after they passed away. I think it was her grandmother, who was a heavy smoker her whole life. She was the classic walk into the house and it was like a haze, no matter when you went to her house, right? And, and so, the interesting thing about this is you can see, of course, how kind of dirty it is and dingy. But when we clean paintings like this that are covered in cigarette smoke, the, the solutions that we use to activate the cigarette smoke and loosen it up and bring it off the surface creates, it makes the smoke that's built up on the painting, it activates it and it smells like somebody smoking in the studio. It's crazy. It's really not pleasant, but um, it's, it's pretty wild. So um, again, you can see the cotton swabs up there um, pulling the smoke off of a painting. The painting is still alive and vibrant underneath the surface. So getting back to the French soldier, you can see removing the varnish from him. You can see how much he really didn't have a yellow um, strap over his shoulder and his shirt and his ascot and wasn't really yellow at all. Um, he was really vibrant and in good shape, really in good order. But this is probably the most extreme example of oxidized varnish I've ever experienced in, in all the years that I've been working on paintings. This painting was really, really oxidized. The varnish was as yellow as I've ever seen because that is what the painting looked like when the varnish was removed. So um, pretty extreme differences. Okay, so one thing that's really important is anything that we do to a painting needs to be reversible. And that means that whatever I do to your painting needs to be able to be undone by another conservator relatively easily without damaging the original painting. Why that is, is, is kind of multifold. First of all, we never want to alter a painting from its original condition. Regardless if it's falling apart, we want to always keep a painting original. We don't want to add new paint to it. We don't want to glue it to a board that we can't remove it from. I don't really want to glue it to a board of any type anyway. Um, but you don't want to do anything that's permanent. You don't want to put new paint onto original painting. So um, I'm going to talk about in painting in a minute. But reversibility is vital, vitally important. What you're seeing here is the backside of a painting that was um, 17th century portrait that somewhere along the line got into the hands of somebody who was going to restore it. I don't know who did it. I don't know if it was a conservator or just somebody at home, but they took the painting 
and they took some probably Elmer's glue and they slapped it down to a piece of cardboard. And that was their idea of fixing the painting. Over the years, it started to bubble. It came to me to be restored and I couldn't get it off the board very easily. I got it off the board. It's actually in my studio right now, still being done. But um, it, to get it off was just shy of going to the extremes of, I could have very easily destroyed the painting had I not come up with a, me a method to kind of get it off the board in such a way that I could save the original painting. Had it been done reversible, it would have been easy for me to get it off with a couple of different methods, which I'll talk about in a minute. So remember that word reversibility. If you ever have a painting restored and you don't, and it's not coming to me, you go to a conservator, make sure you ask, is everything reversible? Is everything that you're gonna do to the painting reversible? Really important. Okay, so what happens when the painting cracks? I said before, there's some treatments that we do to paintings to kind of resolve the cracking issue. And the simple word is called consolidation. We consolidate the paint layer. And what that means is we re-adhere and strengthen the bond of the paint to the canvas or the paint to the panel, if it's on a wood panel. We get into the cracks with an adhesive and we inject it. Sometimes we can do this from the back of a painting where we submerge the whole back of the painting with an adhesive and it soaks through the back of the canvas and it re-adheres all the paint to, this, to the canvas. But sometimes we can't, like with a, a painting on a panel, we can't work from the back of the painting. So we have to do everything from the front. And we do that with a medical syringe. And we take a hot um, synthetic conservation adhesive and we thin it down we put it into a medical syringe, same kind of thing you go to the doctor and get a shot with. And we literally go to every little crack on the painting and we inject adhesive into it. And we let it dry and then it's heat activated. We reheat up the surface with these cool little heating tools that we have. And we reheat the adhesive and we flatten the, the crack down and it dries and it's re-adhered to the surface again. It's extremely time um, consuming to do this to a whole painting that's cracked. Um, the beauty of that type of adhesive is it's removable with a very, very mild solvent, or we can just reheat it. And when we reheat it, it becomes liquid again, and we can take it out. Very, very simple. So the results, now this painting has been fully restored, but the results of consolidating the paint layer like I just described, you can see all the cracking uh, before she was done. And then you can see how even the painting is after she was restored. A lot of that is because of the co consolidation process that we did to all the cracks that were in the painting. So it's a really, really effective way to help resolve that issue and re-strengthen the, the bond and kind of bring the, the cracking down um, and uh, evening out the painting. So relining, this is kind of a cool, uh, a cool painting. This was, this painting had been in this family for a couple of generations. It started out, um, the client's uh, grandparents had it on their wall when she was a little kid. Then her parents got it and it hung in their kitchen for her whole life. Now she was probably in her 60s or 70s and she had took ownership of the painting and wanted to restore it because at that point, she said it really kind of feels like it was the family dog at one time. So um, it was really, really dirty. It, it, was, it had all the things we've talked about, it had a griming, a grime buildup, it was oxidized a whole bit. But the canvas, um, the painting at some time in its life, um, you can see up in the your left-hand corner, the bottom of the painting was very, very, um, it had excessive paint losses at the bottom. Um, my theory on the painting was that it had been stored at some point in time, probably in the basement, 
and the basement flooded and it sat in about a foot of water for a number of days or weeks or whatever and really, really deteriorated the bottom of the painting. So we had to do something to, to, to restore that and re um, strengthen the painting itself so that we could restore it so the painting would, would go on and, and live on. So we do something called relining. Relining is probably the most severe thing that we do to paintings and we only do it when we really need to. Um, not that it's a bad thing, it's a, a relined painting is a good thing, but we always try to be as least invasive to a painting as possible and keep it in its original form as much as we can. Relining, we take the painting and we adhere it to a new canvas. And we do that with reversible synthetic adhesives. Um, there's a few different ways that we reline paintings. One, another way is we use waxes where we heat up waxes and we melt wax into the canvas and it melts through the new canvas to the back of the old, to the original painting canvas and that wax bonds everything together. So that's kind of an older way. They still do that a bit in Europe, not as much here in the States, but now we have a lot more advanced adhesives here um, that work uh, in the same kind of way, except they're synthetic and they never dry out. A wax lining over time will tend to dry up and it'll start to crumble and fall apart and need to be redone. Synthetic um, adhesives now uh, last forever, but if you, we want to undo the painting, if we want to remove that for any reason, all we have to do is heat it up and the painting will peel right off of the, of the new canvas. Reversibility, really important. So here he is. Um, you can see these are, these are called test windows, by the way. That little dot on his nose is a section where I had figured out pretty much what was on the surface of the painting. And I mixed a solution together and I had done some testing on the edges of the painting. So I knew it was gonna work. I knew it wasn't gonna affect the paint layer. So I like to go in and take a painting like this. Once I know the solvent is, is appropriate to the painting, I like to go right into the middle of it somewhere really prominent and just do a little spot just like that because it's just so revealing. Um, so you can see in this picture, you can see the bottom, how just he was really a mess from, you know, two thirds down. Um, but that's him after he was done. So you can see like he wasn't this old yellow dog. He was really this old, you know, of course the painting, we don't know exactly what color he really was, but in the painting, he was kind of this white and gray dog with some black fur and stuff. So, but he point is he wasn't yellow. Okay, so you see up in the right corner, you see the UFO flying around up there in the clouds. That's not really supposed to be there. So I have a policy that I don't patch paintings. I won't put a patch on the back of a painting. The reason for that is that oval shape there, I usually have a little laser pointer, but that little, that oval shape in that big blob that's floating around in the sky, that's a patch on the back of the painting. And it's showing through the front of the painting now. The, the line going through the center of it is what was the tear that it was repairing. And now the tear has reemerged and so has the patch. And we don't wanna see that. All that discolored cloudiness around it is oxidized paint. So I'm gonna talk about in painting in a minute, but oil paint oxidizes. Remember that when it oxidizes, not only does it harden, it discolors. Okay, I'll get to that point in a minute. Um, what happens when you put a patch on the back of a painting? Remember when I was talking about expansion and contraction? of the canvas and what that does to the paint layer. Well, just imagine if you have a canvas, you take that patch and you slap it on the back with some glue. And now your canvas is two layers thick in that one area. 
What's that doing when the canvas is expanding and contracting? Is it expanding, contracting the same? Is it at all? It might not be at all if it was done with a solid, with a, a adhesive glue that solidifies and becomes rock hard. So as the canvas is moving all around it, it's creating a reveal along the edge of the patch. And now you've got this big spot of patch coming through the painting. So, uh, so doing a patch is really not a good idea. So this process is called bridging. So that is the tear, right? So I went through, a, I could do a whole talk just on this painting and getting the patch off and what the whole process is were to do it. But the end result is remove it all and bridge the hole. And what we do is using adhesives, conservation adhesives, we take Belgian linen, we take the strands of linen through, we take the fabric and we pull strands of, of linen off the fabric. We cut them to whatever size that we need and we apply them to the back of the painting kind of like a stitch on a cut, except we're not stitching it, we're gluing it to the surface. Then we take the whole thing and we put it under weight and we let it dry. And when it's done, we've basically almost refibered the tear back together. The conservation adhesive is always pliable, so it'll move with the painting. And the best thing about it is it's reversible, but it's all gone. There's no reveal anymore, right? And all the took all that paint off and redid the in painting and so on. Now. So I'm gonna talk about in painting, okay? And I'm gonna go back to this for a second. So when we in paint, we don't use oil paints because that's what happens. Oil paint, number one, not reversible, right? It oxidizes, can't ever get it off. I mean, it took me a long time to get all that paint off with really, really aggressive solvents that would have taken the original paint off too, had I not done it correctly or if, you know, people will ask me, can you recommend what kind of solvents you use to clean paintings? And I say, I could, but I'm not going to because you're probably going to ruin your painting. No disrespect, but, you know, if I tell you to put some acetone on your painting, you're probably going to strip the painting down to the canvas. It only takes about a minute. That's it. So um, when the paint oxidizes, it discolors. So when the person did all this in painting, which is way overdone, there's way too much paint on the painting. That should be done right on that line of tear. That is it. We don't add paint to paintings. This changes the whole sky. As you saw, oops. Right? There's not, there wasn't even any cloud there for that matter. I mean, there's a little overcast, but that's it, right? That's all the original paint. I only painted where the, where the tear was. That's it. Filled it, painted it, done. So the beauty of the paints that we use for doing in painting is they're called conservation, uh, they're called conser conservation synthetic pigments. And what that means is they don't have any oil in them. They have synthetic resin is the binder instead of linseed oil. They're not activated by petroleum products that can also add to oxidation. They're activated by alcohol. So what that means is back in the old days when they did use oil paints, you'd do a retouch because the synthetic paint pigments haven't been around forever. But you know, if you go back a hundred years, they did all the in painting and stuff with oil paints those oil paints oxidize. Today, the synthetic resins that are the binder um, dry immediately. The oil paint, like I said earlier in the beginning of the talk, that oil paint takes forever to dry, right? So you would do a painting and then they'd have to wait for months before they could finish it with varnishes and things. Today, I can go in, synthetic pigments match the color, do the retouch on it. It's dry that afternoon. If I did it in the morning, I'll put varnish on it the next day and it's done. 
And if I don't like the retouch, say I come in the next morning and I'm like, mm, I don't know, I can still kind of see it. All I have to do is take some white spirits, which is probably the most, uh, the least aggressive solvent that we use in the studio, put on a cotton ball and it wipes right off. One swoop, it's gone. Doesn't affect the paint layer. So, and they're color fast. Because they're synthetic resins, they never oxidize. So it'll stay that color forever. So really important. Um, I take paint off of paintings that were overpainted to such a level, it's jaw dropping sometimes. It amazes me how paintings get overpainted to the point that they do. Um, and it happens to great paintings. I mean, they just did that with a Vermeer painting. They, there was a whole background wall was overpainted. There was a whole different scene on the wall. I mean, a Vermeer, of, like who took, who took a paintbrush and painted over the background of a Vermeer painting? Just think about that for a minute. It's just, it just blows my mind every time. Okay, so the process of in painting, like I said, there's the paint losses. This is Thaddeus's hand. There's the paint loss up in the left corner. We take a, a conservation filler, which in general terms is kind of like the spackle you use when you paint your house, right? It's not, it's conservation, it's reversible and all that kind of stuff. But we can't just fill in a, a void where paint chipped off of a painting. Because if we did, it would just look like there was a chip there and we put paint over it. So now it's a painted chip, right? So we have to fill it in. And when we fill it in, um, Thaddeus is a portrait and he was pretty glass smooth. So um, if a painting has a lot of impasto on it, we take that filler and we recreate the surface of the painting before we go in with the conservation pigments and we color the surface of the filler. And that's how we make it look like the painting. Um, again, only where the paint was lost. So in painting can either be a very simple process. Some paintings don't need a lot of in painting. Some paintings need a little bit here and there and it's good to go. Or it can be pretty extreme. This painting was extremely oxidized. There's extreme cracking throughout his face. Um, and when a painting comes into the studio, the first thing I do to is I take like, I try to take a bunch of pictures of it especially if it's in a condition like this. I'll take as many pictures as I can really up close so I can get some reference and really look deeply into it to see how it was painted in between all the cracks. So I can get a visual idea of what it is that I have to paint. I say that as a conservator, our job, my job isn't to create art, but sometimes it's to preserve it and to restore and sometimes recreate it. So um, this is a good example of, I had to do a little bit of recreating here, but that can get even more extreme. So here's a painting that was in dire, dire condition. It was literally in pieces. Um, I had to put it together like a puzzle, relined it, that's all relining, and then came the challenge, like, how do I in-paint this? How am I going to reference this? Fortunately for me, these were eight foot by eight foot panels that had come over from Europe. They were um, dated probably uh, seven, mid 17th century. Um, and they were part of what was a huge mural and they were broken up into four panels. So I had these four massive panels in my studio. And I'm looking around as I'm, as I'm restoring and putting pieces back together and like I'm taking note of how every painting was done and what the figures look like. Really, really studied the artist and was able to recreate it. And I think pretty accurately based on the tools and knowledge that I was, was able to kind of gather together. Um, so in painting, again, it's all conservation paint pigments. So somebody decides they don't like that job someday, they can go in and wipe it off and do it themselves. <laughs> um, and finally, varnish. Varnish is a really important component of um, protecting a painting. It does two things. First of all, varnish doesn't always have to be shiny. So don't feel like if 
somebody says we're going to varnish your painting, it doesn't mean we're going to turn it into a mirror. Varnishes, we can adjust the sheen of varnishes, but it's really important for two reasons. First of all, varnish protects the surface of a painting. If the painting is full of cracks, varnish is going to get in the cracks and seal it up, keep the humidity out of it. It's also going to create a protective barrier to grime. So if a painting maybe gets dirty or it gets smoked, say there's a backup in your house, God forbid your fireplace backs up and your, and your house fills up with smoke and soot and your paintings are looking gray. Well, we don't need to take all the varnish off of it if it's newly or re relatively in good order varnish wise, we can clean all the smoke off the surface of the varnish and not have to get into the painting itself. Um, so it really protects a, a protective barrier. And it also saturates the color tones. So when you put, when you lay out varnish onto a painting, you can see a little bit here how it's kind of dull over there. And the varnish just brings a painting to life. So the color saturation, it brings all those color tones right up to what they're supposed to be rather than being really kind of dulled down without it um, and feeling kind of flat. So varnish, really important. Today, the beauty is this. We don't use synthetic varnishes anymore. I'm sorry, we don't use natural resin varnishes anymore. You can still use them and a lot of artists still do, but in the conservation world, we know that that can be a problem. We use synthetic varnishes now. So the varnishes stay completely clear for forever, practically. Up to 200 years, they know. The National Gallery Conservation Studio came up with this, this um, type of varnish. They have, they have computer programs and things that they are able to, to test the varnish up to 200 years without changing its chemical makeup at all. So it stays clear um, and it's really, really easily removable. It never turns yellow. So varnish is really important. And that is my talk. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm happy to take questions. I think we're going to pass a microphone around. All right, take a second to warm up. And I saw some pop through in the chat. So let's do one of those and then we'll come right over to you, sir. Best question we had on chat was from earlier in your presentation. Um, what are the different types of oils used throughout the years? Um, really, uh, linseed oil has really been the, the kind of stronghold of, of oil paints. Um, back as far as, as, as I'm aware. What was before oil paints were, um, were all water-based paints. So when oil paints came into play, um, let's see, we're going back to, um, let's say it's 1600, uh, earlier than that. Let's go back to, um, 15th century, they started changing over from um, really using water-based paints that were uh, pigments that were natural pigments. Um, and they started the, they came up with the invention of oil paints, mixing pigments into linseed oils. And many paintings from that time were uh, combined. So when you get to the really, really old paintings like that, when we work on them, we can be dealing with both types of paint. And that can be a little, that can be a challenging undertaking to understand what types of solvents to put on the painting and what not to. So linseed oil is really kind of the, it's been really the basis of oil paints throughout the years. I'm curious about the difference that uh, projects, museums would looked after, cared for, and how you do attach to it. From private owners, you maybe are.
Sure, that's a great question. Um, first of all, yes, just as a quick overview, museums tend to be conservation projects more than they are restoration projects. Most museums are bringing me paintings that have been in their collections, or sometimes it's they're coming in from a private collection, and maybe the private collection hasn't been conserved for some time or not up to the standards that they want them to be to put them on exhibition in the in a museum. Um, where private ownership, yes, I it's not so much the case that a private owner doesn't take care of a painting, but there's multiple facets to that. Paintings can be coming in from estates. They could have been in a family for generations and no one ever really had them conserved. And, and it, at some point they end up in the hands of a generation that now wants to preserve the painting so that the painting can be handed down um, into the future. So it may need some significant work. Also, um, auctions, you know, I always, I don't want to get too into auctions, but I will say that it's, it's um, you want to be very careful when you do auctioning online to buy paintings, because I do a bit of um, restoration work on paintings that come in off of online auctions, and they're not always in the greatest condition, or they're maybe a little bit less in condition than the purchaser thought that it was going to be in. So, you know, there's a little bit of a gray zone there. You got to be careful with that. Can you discuss what materials a conservator uses to restore a painting and how one can maintain paintings going forward? Well, um, yeah, a lot of that is kind of what I talked about. So I feel like I'd be kind of repeating a lot of what I already said. I have some canvas paintings, says Anne, uh, that were improperly loosely rolled. When they were unrolled, the surface has something like folds, like you want to iron it flat. Will putting it on a stretcher fix that? What can be done? Okay, great question. Um, yeah, it, you know, one of the things that we do with paintings that get folded is we don't throw them on the ironing board and iron them, but we do use irons. We have we do use heated irons of different sizes and shapes. And we even have something called a hot table, which is kind of the size of this counter in front of me. They can be six feet by six feet and the whole thing heats up. And we put paintings, we do treatments to paintings off of stretcher bars. Um, and we will put them into the hot table or on the hot table and, and, and heat them up and compress them to get them to smooth them back out. So, yeah, these are definitely things you don't want to do it. Do not take your iron at home and put your painting on the ironing board and iron it. I would try, um, it's a little bit hard for me to say without seeing it. However, you might get some of that out if you stretch it. If the paint is thin and it's not a really thick impossible painting, you might be able to stretch it on a new stretcher and pull those creases out of it. Those because obviously. So I've gone, you know, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so here's how that goes. I, we've gone through renditions of, I've had times where I've had multiple people in the studio working with me at different various levels. Um, I have to be honest with you, I really like to work alone. I find that when, you know, First of all, it's difficult to find people with the right with the right skills and talent that I feel comfortable with. I don't want to worry about that. When somebody hands me a painting to restore, you're handing it to the restorer. I am the guy that's going to work on your painting. Um, so I, it's really just me. Um, I have some help in the studio for doing kind of the other stuff that I don't want to deal with, like bookkeeping and all that kind of stuff. Um, I have a daughter who's 21 years old. She's, a, she's getting ready to graduate college. She has an art history minor. She's worked with me in the studio for about 10 years during the summer breaks of her schooling. Um, she kind of is coming up kind of like I came up, working underneath uh, somebody who's a very competent conservator. Um, I don't think she wants to do it for a living, 
but she's the only person that I will let touch a painting in my studio. Denise works at me in the studio, but she doesn't touch any paintings. <laughs> so yeah, it's me, it's me. And I always, I have like a bunch of paintings going at one time. Different paintings need different things. So um, I'm always, always, Yeah, capacity in in my world is there's always multiple paintings going at one time. Um, paintings take time. Some paintings take a couple of weeks to restore, and some paintings can take months. So I've always got racks of paintings, and there's always a bunch of them in process. So I can be working on a number of pieces at one time. If you know if it's if it's uh, something that's um, overloaded, then it just takes longer for me to get it back to you. And if you're okay with that, I'm good with it. Oh, sorry, I was just uh, typing it in the chat for folks. Uh, the question. Um, oh, uh, uh, something that the gentleman over there had asked about, but and we have a similar question in the chat. How do you determine if a painting is worthy of restoration or are there things that you say no to? Right, right. And you had asked that question that I didn't answer. I apologize. It's a great question. I get asked this all the time. Um, and I have a standard answer to that because it's really how I feel. I will restore any painting. Any painting that, it, a painting can be in pieces. I say anything is restorable. It comes down to a couple of things. Do you love the painting enough to restore it? Do you have the resources to do it? And are you willing to go through the motions to have it done? And that can be a couple of different effects to get there. But the reason I say that is this, I, I'm very fortunate to work with a wide array of clients. I have clients who are major, major, major collectors. I work on museum level priceless paintings, literally. I have people that have paintings that they just love their artwork and the painting may not really be worth anything. I also get a lot of paintings that come through family estates. Let's say it's a portrait and it's a portrait of your uncle or your grandparent or your son or your daughter and, and it needs to be restored. It's probably not really worth anything to anybody but it's worth something to you emotionally. So is that worth restoring if it was destroyed? So I never base a painting on what its material value is, whether it's worth restoring. It really comes down to, I'll restore it for you. It's a matter of if you wanna have it restored. So I think art is art and art is subjective. So. There is great art in the world that we don't even know exists up on top of all the great master painters in the world. So art is art and I can restore, or most conservators will restore a painting no matter what, if you wanna have it done. I'm not the kind of conservator that will look at your painting and insult you and say, that's really not worth restoring. I, I, don't, I don't believe in that, in that approach, so. I have a number of questions online about pricing. And on top of that, I'm going to read another question just in case you don't want to answer that one. What kind of degree or background education do you need to become a conservator restoration expert? And how much does the knowledge of chemistry play in the job? Okay, it's a great question. I will, I will revert one second to the pricing question because this is important for people to know. In the art conservation world, we have something called the code of ethics. And the code of ethics is known throughout the conservation world. It's known through museums, curators, restorers, people like me all over the world. And what that means is we have a certain guideline that we run by. We do things like reversibility. We do things like we don't change your painting. We don't say, geez, you know, he'd really look better if he had a beard and add a beard to the portrait. We don't do that kind of stuff, right? But one thing that is also frowned upon is it's frowned upon for a conservator to be an appraiser. It's considered a conflict of interest. 
They don't want people going to conservers or paintings that people think might be worth a lot of money. So they're going to dump a bunch of money to restore it for the wrong reason, based on what my answer about is it worth restoring or not, right? So that's my I don't so I don't get into pricing with, with paintings. Um, um, could you repeat that question again? I'm sorry. What kind of background education or degree oh, right. and okay. uh, knowledge of chemistry? Yeah, so um, I came up from working under a great conservator and I've worked with and alongside conservators my whole career. Now, I like to think of myself as a conservator that somebody coming up would like to work under. That's the world I come from. Today, educationally, you can go to college and you can get a fine art, you can get a, a bachelor of fine arts degree as a fine artist. You can get a degree in art history and you can get a master's in art conservation. That is kind of the track of education that you can get today um, through the educational system. You have to find the schools that offer it, of course, like anything else. Um, and then you come up with a degree. And you so that kind of gives you a paper that says, hey, I know how to do this. It doesn't give you the years of experience that I think are really, really important. So um, but that's one way if people ask me today, how do I get into this like that? Because I get that asked that question a lot, especially on social media. How do you get into this field? I say do one of two things. Go to art school, find a job working for a conservator. That's your best education. Because you're going to learn things working real world with a conservator that in all due respect, of course, to the education system, you're not going to learn all you're going to learn the technical stuff. There is a bit of, of chemistry. You can you can be really in depth in chemistry in our conservation or you can be not in depth in chemistry at all. There are there are conservation scientists that in most in most museum conservation departments, they have people who are doing the science side of the restoration. You go to the National Gallery in England, they have, a, they have a conservation science lab that the conservators that are working on the paintings, doing all the stuff we just talked about, will bring a painting over to the lab and have them analyze the paint layers so they know what they need to do on the painting. So you don't have to have the scientific chemical depth you need to know a little, you have to understand solvents and how they work and how they mix together and so on. So uh, your your last statement uh, got me to thinking because in visiting museums, uh, they sometimes talk about uh, doing an x-ray of a painting to see if there's um, painting underneath it. When you're doing restoration, do you ever have to do that to get below those past restorations where painting was added? Or is that? You don't have to do x-rays. X-rays will show you literal information about the paint layers. An x-ray will typically show you if there's an, a painting underneath a painting, that sort of thing. Um, I don't come across situations that require that very often, um, but what we do do in the conservation studio all the time is we put paintings under black lights. And if we put a painting under an ultraviolet black light, that will give us some information about what's going on on the paint surface. Is there like a hazy varnish that we're not aware of completely that's there? Or, or, or we're determining, is this varnish or is this like a grind buildup? But under a black light, it'll tell us that. It'll tell us um, many, many paintings, many paintings that have any age behind them have been worked on at some point in their life. It's just commonplace. You go into any major museum, you look at the great masters paintings, they've all been worked, they've been restored, they've been conserved and so on. Um, there can be dabs of retouching on paintings. It's a common thing. A black light will show us that. It'll show us where all that stuff is. So it just gives us information to know what's happening with the painting um, without actually dissecting it with a high power microscope to determine what's the chemical buildup or makeup of the paints underneath. 
that answer your question? Okay. I have a number of questions about whether you clean restore paintings that are other mediums, acrylic watercolor, and also whether you clean and restore other art mediums, sculpture, pottery, etc. cetera. Sure. Um, on the paint level, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, people periodically will bring me an acrylic painting. Now, the reason that doesn't happen that often is because acrylic paintings don't often need to be restored. They'll need to be cleaned once in a while, but acrylic is different than oil. Acrylic plasticizes, so it doesn't have the same oxidation issues that oil paint has. So you're very, you won't really come across an acrylic painting that's cracking from oxidation because it doesn't happen. Um, and they're also, they, you don't get a lot of aging issues with acrylic paintings because acrylic paints in, in that sense of, of, of time, they aren't that old. I mean, they may have accidental issues, but they don't typically have a lot of age issues where things are coming apart and, and chipping and flaking and that sort of thing. Again, it's plastic. That's what acrylic paint dries out to be. So it's always elastic. It's always got given. It's always got pull. Um, really, really not reversible. Acrylic varnishes, really, really difficult to deal with acrylic varnishes. Most of them are not removable. So um, you're kind of stuck with them. Watercolors, um, watercolors fall on a fine line between is it, it's a painting, but it's really, it's, a, it's on paper. So that tends to fall more in line with a paper conservator is going to be somebody that's going to restore a watercolor, not so much a painting conservator like me. Um, I've done some watercolor stuff, um, but if it's like a torn painting, that sort of thing, or if it's got, you know, if it's got discoloration from acid burning, and that's a whole other subject, but that's paper conservation. Oh, I'm sorry. And yes, I do. Um, I, I primarily do oil paints. I get asked for, to, if I can work on all kinds of things. I mean, I get calls of people asking me if I can do all kinds of crazy things. Some of them I can do, and I, some of them I'm willing to say, hey, you know what? Yeah, I'll, I'll check that out. Bring it in. I'll let you know if I can do it. Um, and some things I just say, you know, it's not really not, not something I want to get involved with. Um, I do do some work on exterior painted sculptures and a little bit of exterior bronze stuff. And what kind of got me into that world is just so many people were asking. I was getting calls all the time and I thought, hey, you know what? Um, I, I, I know the makeups of painted sculptures and I, I understand the makeups of bronze. I know how to, how to deal with bronze and that sort of thing. It'd be nice to get out of the studio once in a while. So I found myself getting into restoring exterior sculptures and I actually love doing it. So, um, and that's, that's about it. I don't really do a lot of interior sculpture stuff like, like that, but. Close like a nice book. When you infill, how do you go about matching the colors? When you, meaning when we what, fill, when yeah, we fill when, in a void? When you, when you have to add paint, how do you match the colors to what's already there? Visual. So you have to kind of understand color theory. Um, once we've, once we've, corrected the area we filled it in with a filler and now it needs to be colored right so you're asking how do we match the color tones so you have to understand color theory you have to understand what makes up colors and different variations of color it's all a visual thing i mean i i can look at a color and i pretty much can see what's in the color you know i i have whether it's something i've always had or i've developed it over time whatever I can look at a color and I can look at the color of that chair and I can sit at a rack of paints and I can mix that color. I, I, I just know I can see what's in it. I can feel, I can feel it and see it. So it's, it's a visual thing, you know, and if, you know, if you get it, if you get it to slightly off, you know, you kind of have, have a sense of what you need to adjust it to zero and dial it right into that color. 
on that note, who chooses the paint, co paint colors in your home? <laughs> that's a very interesting question. <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's um, always an interesting conversation, actually. Yeah, it can be. Plus, we have a little bit of personality dif differences in there, too. <laughs> As you, I'm sure you can imagine. It's always fun, though. We, we always land on a good spot, though. So uh, I think we'll make this the last question. Yeah, is that good? I'm, I'm good to, as long as you want to go. I'm, I love answering questions, so I'm good. So for the audience, if, you, if we missed your question, please feel free to go to troyfineart.com and shoot us um, your question in the contact form. Give us a couple of days. We will definitely get back to you. Okay, now I'm going to read this last question for you because it's a sweet one. <laughs> Gonna be a chance for you to toot your horn. Okay, what makes a great restorer different from a very good one, and how do museums decide who should restore a historic masterpiece? Great question. Um, I would say that what the difference between uh, a great restorer and a good restorer—that was the question. It's a good question. Um, I, you know. Restoring paintings for me is not just a process. It's not just a job. It's, it's something that I get very emotionally attached into paintings when I work on them because not only is it just my nature, I think it's really important to understand a painting. You spend time in front of a painting, sometimes you spend out, I mean, hours, weeks, months in front of painting sometimes. Um, and I think it's really important to kind of visually dissect that painting and understand what the artist was doing, what they were intending to do, what their methods were, what talk about color math, like what were their colors? Every artist has a little bit of a different color palette. He's more of this color over more of that color understanding all those things rather than just saying, oh, that's, let me just fix that and blah, 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 and go on to the next painting. Um, so I think really great conservators, I think share that common thread of really, really connecting in with the paintings. Now, a good conservator, a good conservator may do certain processes to the painting that are well-intended, but maybe they're not completely doing the wrong thing, but maybe they're going a little too far on something that they didn't need to do. So I think um, when I look at a painting, I always look at what is the best approach to this painting that is going to require the least amount of invasiveness to that painting. Can I get away with not relining it or do I have to reline it? Can I get away with, um, uh, just doing a bridge on the whole, or do I have to reline the whole painting? So I, I think, you know, understanding the methods um, and, and having that connection to the painting and really looking out for the best interest, having the knowledge. I think, you know, I've been restoring paintings. I'll, I'll give it up. I'm 61 years old. I started working for Jan van de Viver when I was 14 years old. I restored paintings my whole adult pseudo adult life my whole working life it's all i've ever done i've never had a job doing anything else i've worked in different places but i've always worked in, in in art conservation so i think years and years of knowledge really kind of gives you and kind of rises you to i believe to a level of being a really great conservator if you have all the other parts that you've developed and you're good at what you do what was the other? Oh, oh, and how does a museum choose? It varies by the museum. So I do a lot of work for private museums, you know, so private museums will tend to go out and look for conservators that are, have what it takes to work on paintings in their collection and know that their paintings are in good hands. Some big major museums, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, you know, the Louvre, I mean, all these iconic museums have conservation departments in the museums. It's not like it was when I worked for Jan. Jan used to work on paintings from the Metropolitan Museum. That would never happen today. 
those paintings don't leave their conservation department. So it's, um, and those conservators, it, again, it depends on the museum. It could be, uh, they may have certain requirements. They may require people to have an education masters and so on, or they may go by referrals to hire people that want to work for a museum rather than their own private practice like I do. So depends on the museum. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We've, there's been, you haven't been able to see it, but there's lots of thank yous. and, and Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And Zoom. Also, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. We, we really appreciate your time and your expertise. Thanks for being with us. My tonight. pleasure. Thanks for having me.